Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, symposium on the evaluation of, of uh, uh, general purpose uh, AI. And maybe uh, uh, you are wondering why this is a symposium. And the answer is very simple. I just asked GPT, uh, how should I call this event? And then it came with this answer. So that's the reason why. And the important thing, this is kind of, even if we call it a symposium, this is a kind of a, an informal occasion, but we have great speakers for this occasion that are informal in a way that you can ask questions at any time. Um, but important because we have two great speakers today with us and also important because the topic is very relevant because these are, these are, uh, these are no longer tools that we look like uh, people will, will be using in the future. We see our students, we see people using these tools every day. And we know that they can do very great things, they can, do, they can fail uh, catastrophically, and we don't know why, and we don't know when. So trying to evaluate these systems and what they are capable of and when they fail and why, I think that these are even more important questions than building these systems. So maybe we are rushing uh, uh, to uh, building these systems rather than understanding them or trying to evaluate them well before deployment, something that some of you as computer scientists would be kind of a, a surprise for you that, that the systems are released even before they are tested uh, or well tested. So yeah, that's a little bit the, the idea for the, uh, uh, for the event today, having two great speakers with us. I'm going to introduce them. There will be, will be around uh, one hour with each of them probably about 40 minutes, uh, I'm just taking some of your time. I'm sorry, but yeah, we'll, we'll probably just, uh, this is a kind of a relaxed um, 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 situation, so we are not going to be that strict on time, depending on the questions that we have. So basically it's going to be about 40, 45 minutes of, of presentation, maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes of discussion, especially depending on how, how eager you are with your questions. And then if, uh, there's interest and that we can even have some kind of a joint discussion at the end about more general questions that are not specifically related to the talks or the, the you, uh, some, some discussion about this kind of a uh, uh, general purpose AI, what we have around and how this can be evaluated. Yeah, this is what we are going to have today. So first of all, uh, so we are going to have two speakers. First speaker is uh, uh, Tony Cohn and the second speaker is uh, Ryan Burnell. Let me uh, introduce uh, Tony uh, first, our first speaker. So uh, I would be here for an hour if I would explain all the accolades and uh, the trajectory of uh, Tony in artificial intelligence. But he's a professor of automated uh, reasoning at Leeds University, the University of Leeds. And he's also affiliated at the Turing and now he has a program about the, specifically about the evaluation of foundation models. So I think that he's a, he's a perfect person today just to talk us or to talk a little bit about us and to, uh, what he's doing. And um, yeah, without further ado, please, uh, Tony, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Jose for organizing the symposium, inviting me here and for the kind introduction. So this is, as you see on this slide here, this is actually, I'm going to be mostly talking about some joint work here, which is, uh, I started, but then, because Jose and I have been collaborating for uh, two or three years now, I guess, uh, in the context of some OECD project on the future, uh, impact of the AI on future of work and education. And so um, it, it seemed natural to involve Jose in, in a paper, which I'll mention in a moment. So, and I'll explain, I'll explain the title, what it means, uh, in, in a moment, but for the, in case you're not, f you remember, if you're not familiar with LLM acronym before, remember that you'll need it. Um, so I'm guessing that pretty much actually everybody in the room does know what a large language model is, um, but just in case, here's just a quick recap. Um, these are generally uh, generative pre-trained transformers, so they're pre-trained on very large corpuses of, of data, usually sort of scraping the whole of the internet and maybe more. Um, and, the, and then they're trained up on this, and the idea is that there are then a model of, of the language that's found in this corpus, and then you can use that um, to do subsequent tasks, which is why these things are called foundation models, because they're foundation for building something else. But although large language models are 
often claim to be foundation models. Not all foundation models are language models necessarily. There might be ones built on other modalities. <coughs> And usually for these downstream tasks, uh, they have to be uh, fine-tuned for that particular um, task. And as you can see, these things are you know, huge now. GPT-4 has one trillion parameters, a uh, you know, huge step up from GPT-3. And you know, as somebody who's been watching AI for many, many years, I am really surprised how good these things are, or at least how pounding. I mean, it is the level of fluency of these things is are just ama amazing, at least to me, and I think to many other people. Um, and you could ask it to write in the style of the American, the American Constitution about uh, missing a pair of uh, one, pe one of your socks. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing, and it, it sounds really fluent, uh, often. Uh, so fluency is something they're good at, and often they produce really good answers, but sometimes they produce gibberish, or stuff that looks correct, and there's been a lot of stuff in the press about so-called um, hallucinations though some people don't like that word hallucination because it kind of applies a, a level of agency and understanding which uh, maybe is, at least I would agree, is probably not really uh, warranted. So I say there's been a lot of, um, this is just, whole area has completely exploded. I was kind of aware of this a, bit, uh, a few years ago, but now, as you see, I mean, I'm not going to go through all of this, um, this tree on the right, but just, it's just there to give you a, a flavor for, okay, you've ha heard of ChatGPT up here, um, and, and barred up here in GPT-4 here, but there's a lot of other ones here which you might not have heard of, and there's just a huge amount. Most, there's a lot of um, a, a closed source ones, uh, GPT and barred, but there's also some open source ones as well, and you can see that distinction made here with a different coloring scheme. Um, uh, the fact that closed source then makes them even harder to evaluate. Um, if they were open source, open data, we knew what they were trained on, it would make it our, our job of evaluating these things a, a bit easier. But so, yeah, I, um, unless you've had your TV, radio, and social networks turned off over the last six months, you know what ChatGPT is. Uh, but I just wanted a brief recap. So it's a, it's a very active research area. Every week there seems to be a new paper, or multiple new papers out in this area. It's really hard to keep... I, I mean, I try to do research now. I spend my whole time just reading about other people's research. Um, people who are working on new downstream tasks, uh, new, new multimodal models starting to appear. And um, th there's, there's, uh, people are looking at different things uh, apart from new downstream tasks, but also evaluating the capabilities and limitations. So my particular focus on this Turing project is going to be on common sense. I've got another uh, colleague looking at theory of mind and somebody else looking at somebody else. Uh, people looking at the uh, extent to which these things are biased and given the training data is biased and there's been a lot of talk about that in the press. Uh, it's not surprising that you get bias in the resulting um, large language models. And so I say my particular interest then is in spatial reasoning. Uh, we call common sense reasoning more generally but in particular spatial reasoning. Um, and you know, I, this is some spatial representation of reasoning, something I've been interested in uh, a long, long time. Uh, Pat Hayes, who you see um, uh, pictured on the top right, was one of the early uh, names in artificial intelligence, and he was um, my, my main PhD supervisor. And he, during that time, he started work on what he called naive physics, so that our everyday common sense understanding of the everyday physical world. Uh, you know, what happens if, it, if I were to tip this mug up this bottle upside down, well, the floor would get wet, but if I tip this one upside down, then no nothing would happen. Um, and so he wrote um, s several papers there, and I kind of, I, as I was a student at the time, and I got really interested in this, and so I start, immediately after my PhD, I then started um, working on this, and I've really been working on uh, aspects of spatial reasoning ever since, and you can see some of the areas here that I've been working on. And Common sense reasoning, when I say CS, I mean common sense um, reasoning has been mostly of interest in the symbolic AI community, but now recently, uh, the deep learning community have, have taken uh, a lot of interest in this as well now. So the question I'm interested in is, do these foundation models, such as these large language models, actually have common sense, or could they provide a foundation for common sense reasoning? So what kinds of spatial reasoning is to test? Well, so something I've been particularly known for and it's something I spent a lot of my career on is qualitative spatial reasoning, so, uh, which can maybe be broken down to a number of different sub-areas, things like Marian topology. So Mariology is the theory of parthood, and topology is when you take connections into account as well, directions left, right, above, below, uh, cardinal directions, uh, shape, distances, relative distances, trajectories of things moving through space and time. 
uh, and so forth. And of course, th there's a lot of uh, these kind of spatial problems uh, in existing common sense uh, um, benchmarks, uh, but maybe they're not testing these um, exhaustively. And uh, so particularly these uh, existing common sense benchmarks have a lot of potential flaws for the evaluation of large language models, and that's something that's being increasingly uh, discussed at the moment. Uh, one thing that's been noted, I mean, this is not now not unique now to common sense, but more generally, the leakage from the benchmark into the training set of the large language model, which then means that you, it's actually, it's like a giving a student a copy of the exam paper before um, they sit the test, um, even though they're not explicitly memorizing these um, Large language is not explicitly memorizing, but clearly it is going to help them. Um, large, uh, there's often lacks evaluation criteria. Uh, so, for example, with the so-called Winograd Schema Challenge, and I'll show you what a Winograd Schema Challenge is uh, a little bit below, but basically it's, um, it's where you get pairs of sentences and you have uh, something like an it, word it somewhere in it, and you have to decide what the it refers to. There's two noun phrases, and you have to choose which one. And you really want to evaluate those things t together because if you just say, you know, it refers to the same thing, the, the first noun phrase both times, you get a guarantee to score 50%. But if you evaluated them um, independently, so together, th then that would then um, use your score as a zero. Because it really clearly hasn't understand, uh, understood the, the situation. You can get uh, artifacts in the data set where uh, maybe statistics can help disambiguate the pronoun resolution. One example of that is, you know, um, which is when the two noun phrases are a bus and a racing car, and it's about speed, and obviously, statistically, you know that racing cars are going to go faster than buses. Um, and then there's something, there's a paper that, in fact, Ryan led on as recently published in Science, um, and they say using the way people uh, use these, uh, these common sense, these benchmarks, and particularly common sense benchmarks, is, um, is that they just using aggregate statistics, so basically computing things, that things like F1 scores and accuracy and so forth, uh, can mask underperformance in particular more niche areas. And again, I'm not going to give that talk here. That would be a separate talk, but have a look at the paper. And the other problem is that often these benchmarks, they make it easier themselves to build the benchmarks and to evaluate them by having things like multiple choice questions. And indeed, that's also true of the Wittigat Schema Challenge. Um, because there's only two choices, the two noun phrases. Uh, but that means that you know, you're already giving a helping hand to the, to the uh, system because it's only got a small number of choices rather than it's going to find an arbitrary answer uh, from scratch. So the thing that I've started working on uh, jointly with Jose is this so-called dialectical evaluation where we conduct, instead of having this one-off series of individual instances, we conduct an extended conversation with the system. And the next, each question we ask may depend on the previous answer. And so the goal of this evaluation is not to produce uh, aggregate performance values, not, not average accuracy or anything like that, but to find failures. So just one instance of failure is, even if it gets 99 things correct, uh, that's still a, a, an interesting um, way of mapping the, the extent of the performance of the system. And so we, this gives us an opportunity to check for consistency and get more reinsurance about um, anecdotal we get to assurance uh, of the boundaries of the system. Of course, the disadvantage is it's hard to uh, automate. You know, I spent, in build, doing this talk, I spent a lot of my time in front of ChatGPT and Bard actually having conversations. with it's a lot of fun. And um, sometimes I'm really surprised about how good it is. And other times I think, really? Particularly maybe when I ask the same question, just with changing some names, you'll see, you'll see later. And, it, you know, I, it, I persuaded it to get the answer right for the first set of names, and I ask a new, a new names, exactly the same structure of the centers, and then he gets it wrong. Uh, <clears throat> so this is kind of the summary slide from the, the archive, archive version of the paper, which I uh, joined with uh, Jose. And I'm, as I'm, obviously, I'm not going to go through all of this, and you can't really read this, but I don't know whether actually, well, whether we're not the stage lights off. But the, the, the thing I want you to look at this is the fact that we're evaluating uh, four diff sorry, five different uh, large language models going across. We've got uh, the, the first co uh, column here is chat, C, uh, chat GPT 3.5 Turbo um, with the sort of web version. This is the playground version. This is chat GPT 4 uh, on, on the web. This is chat GPT 4 on the playground version. And this is Google's Bard. And then we're, in each case, we're evaluating two things, whether it gets the correct answer or not, and whether the explanation it gets for the correct answer is correct or not. Because sometimes it will produce the right answer, but give a, a fallacious explanation. So it's clear that it hasn't really understood uh, what, 
and it's just got lucky, if you like. Um, and um, we, uh, if you see a green tick, that means we, qualitatively, subjectively, using our knowledge and experience as human beings, have judged it to be uh, a good answer or a good explanation. A cross means we think it's definitely flawed. And we've got this sort of half mean, means it, well, it's made a bit of a mistake, but it's not completely wrong. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want you to take that half as being 0 0.5. It's not a metric half. It's just, you know, not, not completely right and not completely wrong. So you can see, and along the bottom here, there are some, uh, um, and again, this is too small, but basically, um, the, in terms of uh, just averaging this, and I, having just said that I don't want to use aggregate statistics to evaluate these things, I don't want to go and plug these numbers, but it's just interesting to briefly look at those. So ChatGPT... Um, 3.5 turbo gets 19 right uh, in both versions, whilst um, uh, GPT-4 and BARD all get 30 right, um, ignoring any benefits from the halves. Um, and the explanations we have 14, 12, 20 improvement now for GPT-4, 22, uh, and in the uh, playground version 30, so it's better. And, but then Ch BARD is much worse in its explanations. Uh, and it gets a little bit better, obviously, if you add in the halves. So I say, this is just to give you a qualitative feel that, you know, if there was green ticks everywhere, I wouldn't have bothered writing the paper. Uh, you know, there clearly are problems here in these, these large language models understanding um, the spatial representation, spatial reasoning. So I'm, I'm going to go through about two or three of these examples from the paper, just very briefly, just to give you a flavor of that. But mostly, I'm going to focus on some new um, ones um, which are not in the paper and the kind of, um, uh, I thought, more, more fun to present rather than just repeating what's in the paper. So this is one of the ones from the paper, and this is the one I just alluded to earlier when, about changing names. So this is actually an example of uh, one of those Winograd schema challenges uh, I talked about earlier, because you can see there's, there's two versions of this sentence. Tom threw his school bag down to rage after he was the top of the stairs. Tom threw his school bag down to rage, round eight, but down to Ray after he reached the bottom of the stairs. Uh, who reached the bottom of the stairs. So the question in each case is, who does the who ref uh, refer to? And in the first case, it correctly says Tom. Um, in the second case, it incorrectly says uh, Tom again. And this is again what I mean about evaluating both things together. Um, so I then said, so this is the conversation I had with it, and I said, I sort of actually told it, you know, get, look at, think again. Uh, and they said, oh, is always apologizing. I apologize for the confusion. In that case, if he refers to Ray, then Ray reaches the bottom of the stairs. Well, it's a bit of a cop out as an answer, but anyhow. So I thought I'd also test who has the school bag now. Does it understand about transfer of possession? So yes, it does. I, I asked that, uh, I think, in this case, and you got that right as well. Um, but then I, I switched the name. So exactly the same sentence, but instead of uh, John and Ray, we've got, sorry, Tom and Ray, we've got John and Frank. And it gets it wrong, even though you know, it's got it right now with uh, t uh, t Tom and Ray. So, um, and this is actually, the f I think, about one of the only times I've seen this. So, it, of course, it, it is an extended conversation. It's all part of its context. And it hasn't been able to c correctly disambiguate, I keep track of which names. And clearly, if you're doing things like understanding a story, then you've got multiple characters in your story. And then keeping track of which character's doing what is, is just really important. Um, so here's another example from the paper. Again, the, these are all ChatGPT4 in the web version, unless I say explicitly otherwise. Um, I have a child's shape, shape sorter toy, uh, which is slightly different to normal, because actually, they can all, all the shapes can fit through the circle, but the other ones can only fit through their own. So I say, oh, um, it, it, they can all fit through the circle. Which of the shapes is supposed to go through the cutouts? Uh -uh. And so it then says, um, plus will go through the plus, um, circle will go through the circle, equilateral goes through the uh, equilateral, um, and so forth. But explicitly then, I mean, this is true, but it hasn't said that it will also go through the circle. And I might have given some benefit of the doubt, but then at the end, it explicitly says, and will not fit in the other cutouts. So it's ruling out that possibility, even though I've said in the beginning, actually. So it's hardly any reasoning to do here. It actually has to just go back and read the original question again. So it clearly hasn't comprehended that properly. Um, interestingly, actually, this was done when we were writing this paper. Uh, I guess it was about late March we were doing these, this, this experiment, something like that. I actually tried it again this week. It gets it right. Um, so, and I, in no, in, for all of the conversations I've had, and I think you've had as well with um, ChatGPT, we haven't 
uh, given any feet. You know, there's an option to give a thumbs up or thumbs down. I've not done that because I'm not trying to contaminate. Uh, I, want to, I, I want to be able to go back later and try these things again and see if it's improved. Of course, there may be people watching in the background and noticing this is a, 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 a something. Um, so it's not clear why it's got better. Uh, again, if, it, if they made it open, we could see all the trainee data, including the human feedback. Then we could see that. Well, there might be a huge amount of data, of course, but in principle, we could, we could find out. Um, and here's another one uh, from the, the paper. Form, and this is actually an example from a common sense uh, uh, benchmarks problem page, uh, page curated by uh, people from the Sabonic AI community, uh, Ernie Davis and Leo Morgenstern in particular. So formally characterize the structure of a metallic chain. What will happen if one picks up? Um, this is actually a slight variation of what, what they said. I, I've adapted it, but it was inspired by, by the, their problem. What happens if you pick up one end of the chain and walk away? And I say a little bit more what I mean by a chain because earlier versions of it misunderstood. So I, I gave it a bit of help there. And um, the, this thing goes on for long. I didn't want to put all of the response. It's a very long response with about four or five points. But here, as, as I pull the chain, it will result in the chain's length decreasing, which is clearly wrong. And it's and if we're sort of being extended over the, 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 the ground. It actually says it's going to end up in a pool of change forming on the ground or surface. So you know, clearly completely misunderstanding uh, what, what, the, what the task is about. Interestingly, though, the playground version of ChatGPT4 gets it right. So given that ch oh, the ChatGPT version on, uh, on the web is based on the other one, it's a little bit surprising. But we, we have seen quite a bit of variation between the two. Um, so this is a new conversation, which was inspired by, there's a, there's a spreadsheet on the web where people, if you're trying these things, you can then uh, put in examples which go wrong. And so I looked at that, and I looked at ex uh, examples of spatial reasoning, and actually there are only two examples of uh, ones which are labeled spatial reasoning in that. It's one of my tasks to do when I get some time is to actually populate that, but I just haven't had time to do that yet. Anyhow, so this is actually, this is a, you know, there's a mathematical theorems about this, um, that how, many, how many points can you put uh, on an n by n grid? And in general, the math says that it's 2n plus 1 is the maximum, where n is an n by n, grid, n by grid. But it's not always as big as that. It might be smaller. Um, I think it's more likely, the larger it is, the more likely it is to get, you're able to get more. So I ask, um, uh, how can I choose the maximum number of points on a 3 by 3 grid search that no 3 in a line? Please show a diagram. And I actually didn't realize until I looked at this, you could, could I even ask it to do a diagram. So it draws this cute little um, th uh, ASCII art uh, diagram here. And it says, you know, explains it. And it says, as you can see, there are no three points x in a row, column, or diagonal. Hello. Um, so, um, you yeah, know, clearly it's got it wrong. So I then had quite a long ex 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 chat with um, ChatGPT4 here. And I'm not sure, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. But um, so I am, um, so that. Sorry, I, I think I've actually got the wrong prompt here. Uh, I, my cut and paste didn't work because this is the same prompt as the one immediately before. Um, so yes, yeah, sorry, this is a wrong prompt. But basically, I pointed out that it, there was an error there as it had. Fitness. So Paul, let me try again. Here, the correct way of choosing five points. Um, there are only four points in your diagram. Um, my apologies for the oversight. You have to correct. Um, and, and, but this one's the same as the first one. Um, try again. Um, this configuration is, again, it's got it wrong. Um, in fact, it's, and then I carried on for a bit more, and I've, I'm not showing you all of that here. I say, in fact, it's possible to play six points uh, and on a grid and satisfy the constraints. I apologize for the confusion earlier, and now it actually gets it right the first time. Congratulations. But I thought, is that the only solution? Um, no, it's not the only solution. The arrangement could be rotated or reflected. OK, that's good uh, to produce a show, you know, knowledge of the kinds of spatial things you can do, uh, rotations of reflections, uh, such that uh, you, um, and it says that there are eight solutions. Well, actually, they're not eight, because um, one, six, and seven are identical. Two, four, five, and eight are identical. Three is wrong, because it's got three in a row. Uh, and eight is uh, actually a rotation, not a reflection. Um, and can't be as actually what this one um, this is actually symmetric about both diagonals. So clearly, reflecting about either diagonal is not going to change its configuration. So you know, got some right, some wrong. Um, 
Uh, I only want to count uh, configurations which are not congruent. I sort of, um, moreover, one of your solutions is uh, Bob has three in a row. I apologize. Um, so now it's, it tries to bridge you two new ones. First one is before, another one with a three in a row. And it's only got five points. I didn't actually point out it had three in a row. I just said it's only got five points. Um, I apologize. And it gives me the same one again in this for the second attempt for the, for the second configuration. Again, it has a different one, but again, three in a row. Um, and I now say, please annotate each diagram with a number of points. Uh, I was hoping it's going to do both row, columns and row, uh, rows and columns and maybe diagonals, but it only did the row. Um, so now it's, it's got that correctly for this. Um, that's good. But I just wanted the other one as well. Um, and uh, it can't count. Um, it's got two points, one point, two points. That's only five, but it says there's six. Try summing the number of points. I didn't point out it had a, a row of three again. Uh, and um, it's, it's arithmetic is out yet again. Apologize for the confusion. Um, and so finally, um, hit, so then it says a single uh, configuration with six points. Um, but um, it, it seems to be misunderstanding what I meant by congruent because it was allowing for rotations uh, uh, and reflection. As that was allowing, so I said I want to with ones which are uh, which can't be uh, superimposed without rotation. So in that case, it's still having problems with things three in a row um, because it's now got three in a row horizontal. Um, read your first annotation above. The first annotation was uh, you know three points in this row. So you know clearly a safe. The task is not three points in a row. It's got three points in a row. Um, um, I say, I don't, let me just carry on to this one. So still wrong. Let me give you a hint. Take the first configuration and rotate it. And then now finally, uh, it gets it right. We've got the two, the two configurations I was looking for. Um, but it says they're non-congruent in the sense they cannot be superimposed by rotation or reflection. Well, they can be superimposed by rotation, but not by reflection. OK, that was it. So that, that was, I partly went through that sort of long sequence there because I wanted to show you an example of an extended dialectical sort of di um, interaction where we have this dialogue. And I'm trying, in a way, I'm trying to help it, but I'm also trying to test its limits of understanding. And it's clear that it was often not taking hints, or at least not remembering hints, and um, having once been pointed out, you know, yes, you really got to get check the theater row. It was continually making that mistake. Now, in a way, maybe this is an unfair test of for large language model. I mean, diagrammatic reasoning is likely to be hard for uh, a, 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 something which is purely language, and maybe a multimodal version would do better. So, you know, I'm not, don't want to be too harsh on, on, on the NLN here. But uh, it's just kind of quite a nice example, I thought, of an extended interaction. Um, this is, I just thought I'd show you one example for BARD. ChatGPT4 uh, and GPT4 is actually a bit better on this than the BARD, but I just thought I'd show you this because it kind of also shows you the different style of answers that BARD has. So this is, um, as an, one of the projects I've got, other projects I've got at the moment is um, an ESRC, which is a, a UK National uh, Research Council and an American NSF project jointly with Stanford. Um, where we're looking at uh, various texts, Holocaust survivor testimonies, and these kind of travel writings um, from uh, walking, walks in the Lake District, which is a pretty area in the northwest of England. And I, I don't expect you to read or remember all of this, but basically this is just a, a description of what the things you might want to do if you're going from Penrith in the first instance um, towards then this uh, large lake called Oswater. Interestingly, the lake, although it's called the Lake District, None of the bodies of water in the Lake District are called lakes. They're all called things like water and mirrors and, and so forth. So, um, but anyhow, w I'll be calling it a lake just for the purpose of simplicity. Um, there's, I've just highlighted these, these things, things are red, because actually, they say this is taken from a text published in, I think, if I remember correctly, 1889 um, by this guy. Well, it's actually not, we don't know who the author is, but it's basically a travelogue. Um, and well, I was actually sort of, because, as you'll see in a moment, Bard actually brings in outside information. And it was giving me information which wasn't in my text. It was bringing in information it sort of had in its knowledge base or model from outside. And I wanted to start checking it. And then when I did that, I actually realized this was, this was actually wrong. So the human writer actually got things wrong. And 
it is actually, Hallenfell is actually on the east, Stour, um, Stiberia Crag is on the west, and Birkfell is on the east. Um, so I've done this actually twice, once with the incorrect version and once with the incorrect version. Uh, for ChatGPT, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't seem to uh, make, generally doesn't need to make use of external knowledge in answering. And I said, here's a text, answer questions on the text. As you'll see, Bard actually brings in all kinds of stuff which is not in the text. Which, in a way, is kind of fair, as I didn't say explicitly, only answer questions based on the text. Just to give you a sort of, a sort of diagrammatic thing of what's going on, this is Penrith just up here, and the journey that is being recommended is you go from Penrith to, this is a modern map, this is obviously, uh, I dish, I've got access to the historical one, but the colour one's easier to see, the historical one's only black and white. So it goes from here to Emont Bridge, and we cross the bridge at Emont Bridge, uh, and then we take the first road on the right uh, down here, following it along until we get to uh, Pooley Bridge, which is both a town, actually both Emont Bridge and Pooley Bridge are both towns and bridges, which kind of doesn't really confuse us, but as you'll see, actually probably confuses uh, the large language models a bit. Um, and uh, then it, what it's recommending is you then go, eventually go down to Patterdale via this, uh, the, the western shore, but it recommends that first of all, you take a diversion of a few miles along the eastern shore and you get some nice views across uh, the lake from the eastern shore. So that's just to visualize what's actually going on here. Um, so, so his response, Bar's response to that was, sure, I'd be happy to do that, uh, to answer your questions about the passage. And then it doesn't wait for me to ask it questions, it gives me questions and asks them for himself. You know, listen, read the exam paper. Um, so anyhow, it asks some questions, um, which actually, um, and it does actually use some of my, it does actually here is is using the text I gave it in its answers, and these all seem to be uh, uh, good. So now I can start giving it questions. Describe the route from Penrith to a place where a good view of Ellswater may be uh, obtained. Um, so sure, and now this is, you can see, where it starts introducing external knowledge. Because I know where did I mention road numbers. Uh, in fact, actually, if, you, if the A6, which you take, not the A66, A66 goes east-west, uh, you'd be heading south, not north in any case. Uh, if not six miles, it's about a couple of miles. Um, is it 1.6 miles? And the second thing is not to really get to Pooley Bridge, this is 4.7 miles. Um, and you don't cross the bridge uh, to take the viewpoint. Um, it takes much longer than 10 minutes. To, you know, there's all kinds of things wrong. So brought in external knowledge, which could be good if it was correct, but the external knowledge it's brought in actually is mostly wrong. Um, so no, it didn't help. Um, in which direction will I see views of the lake? So remember, this is when I'm going down the eastern shore of the lake, but it says you will see um, the entire length of the lake. Well, actually, that's kind of surprising, um, in fact, given the, um, the topography of it, because actually there's lots of mountains in the way. Um, but that's why I put it in orange here, because it's kind of, you, you can't really tell either way without actually looking at the contour maps uh, and doing some fairly detailed spatial analysis. Um, in which cardinal direction are the views of the lake? So if you're facing the lake, the views will be to the south. Well, yeah, clearly they will be to the south. There will be some little bit of view to the north, but mostly I was expecting the answer. You know, if you're standing on the east shore, where's the view of the lake? You'd expect to say west, not south. I mean, although it's true. At least it should say you know, south, east, and north. Uh, south, west, and north. Uh, the lake, it says the lake runs roughly northwest to southeast. Well, you remember that map I put up? Actually, it runs northeast to southwest. Um, and it says the views will be on your right. Well, no. Um, in which card direction uh, am I facing when you say the views will be on my right? It says, you know, if the views are like you are facing east, but that's kind of, why would I be facing east when I'm on the east shore of the lake trying to see views of the you know, lake? Um, and then it's going to be more like right behind in any case. And in any case, um, given the northwest, the true northeast, north southwest orientation, it was wrong. Ooh. What happened? Oh, I pressed the wrong button. Um, um, how many bridges are mentioned which cross the Emont? Um, so it's, although it, it's, um, so it says there's the only bridge over the Emont uh, below Ellswater, but actually uh, Emont Bridge goes over the Emont, as you might guess from the name. Um, it says the, it's, on, it's got the road name wrong again. Um, Actually, if it was really using knowledge for the external database, actually, 
the uh, Puli Bridge old structure, the um, Grade II listed structure, got washed away in floods in 2015, and the more modern, which is well before the cutoff date, the more modern structure is actually you know, not a listed structure anymore. So, again, it's not actually fully understood the, you know, the external knowledge base. And the, it is the Emont Bridge is not on the B46478, it's on the A6. Okay, um, which direction the second reach from the first reach? So it draws me this rather bizarre diagram with names of reaches which actually don't exist on the internet even. I've got no idea where it's got these internets, these reaches. The reaches don't have names. And uh, Dungeon Gill is a place somewhere else in the, in the Lake District. So yeah, all kinds of errors. And when it says the, if you look at the descriptions of the reaches here, actually, because it says the first reach is between Poole Bridge and Glen Ridding, and the second one is between Glen Ridding and Howtown. The Howtown is halfway between Poole Bridge and Glen Ridding, so it actually means the second reach, according to this description, is part of the first reach rather than being separate. So um, I, I went on for longer as well, but I, that's yeah, enough for that. Uh, this is a kind of standard problem puzzle which people are often given. Uh, uh, I thought I'd try it on, on this. There, we're back to ChatGPT4 now. If I work miles, five miles south, east, and then north, where, uh, where am I? And it actually knows this is a standard problem. So this is obviously leakage from the training set. I think this is actually, what, this is again, this is the most recent version. When I gave it, it previously it got it wrong. Uh, but it's now got it right. Um, um, and it's often, previously it was often uh, expressed in terms of what color the polar bears. Um, and because there are no bears on the, on the South Pole, so it, means it rules out the second possibility, which is, I actually didn't actually, hadn't thought of the second uh, answer, which, where if you're basically close to the South Pole, where the circumference of the latitude is five miles, and you start off five miles north of that, then that's also a possible solution. Um, so it gets that right, but then I give it the sort of the flip version of it for the South Pole. Uh, if you go five miles north, five miles east, five miles south, and here there's, there's one main solution, but it hasn't, it says, but it says explicitly now, unlike the previous case where you can be in the South Pole, you can't be in the North Pole. Uh, and so it says the only solution is the South Pole, but clearly it's symmetric. If, you know, uh, so it, it, it's got it wrong again there. So it, it's surprising. Any human being, even if they haven't got the second answer, um, if I then told them the second answer, surely they get the second answer when, uh, if I asked them about the South Pole version. Um, so yes, it, it then apologizes. So this is now um, sort of just reprising that thing about which directions are the views, but I'm now not at this is a new, a new different conversation, not part of the Puli Bridge conversation. This is ChatGPT4, and I'm just asking it a series of questions about if I walk in different directions along different shores of the lake, uh, where are the views of the lake? And so first of all, if I'm going, walking south along the western shore, which direction? So that clearly, this views on that case should be on my left. It says now on the right. Um, and it also, um, but it does get the lake in the direct direction. It says that the lake is to the east, which is correct if I'm on the western shore. If I turn around, it, it, it now, interestingly, it's and perhaps unsurprisingly, since it got it wrong here, it's now flipped right-hand side to left-hand side, which is wrong. Uh, the lake is on the left, again, which is wrong. But interesting, where has it got east here? correctly. Clearly the cardinal direction of the views hasn't changed just because I'm facing a different direction. But now it's flipped this as well. Um, if I walk south along the eastern shore, so this is now the eastern shore on the western shore, similar errors. Um, though in this case it doesn't make the second error. It gets it west correctly both times. If I ask at the southern and northern shores, I'm not going to show you those, but I know if I'm walking west along the northern shore and east along the southern shore and so forth, it gets not all right. So it's a particular problem about facing north and south. Uh, so some more questions now, new conversation about testing uh, geographic reasoning. Ah, ah, lost track of time because I restarted it. Five minutes, okay, right. Um, if I walk, so I, I, the diagram is for your benefit, not, I didn't give the diagram to ChatGPT. Um, but just so you can easily see what the answer is. So all the reasoning is, uh, is correct until it gets to the final uh, conclusion where it says the starting point is northeast, where clearly it should be um, southeast. Uh, but if I give a similar one, which is a little bit more complicated, it does all the computations and gets it right. So, you know, win some, lose some here. It's not, 
I mean, it's interesting, it, can, it does, although I didn't explicitly ask it to, um, to compute the answer in this way, it's doing the sort of step-by-step -step reasoning, and these intermediate com um, co computations are, are all correct. Um, oh, yes. Um, so here's a, a sort of standard geographical uh, thing that uh, geographers uh, so often talk about. Are all places, well, it's phrased slightly differently. I've, I've changed the way it's phrased slightly here. Are all places in Nevada east of all coastal cities in California? Anybody want to give me an answer for that? How well do you know your geography of the western US? I mean, the kind of first sight, you think, well, Nevada, if you know where Nevada is, Nevada is basically to the east of California. So the first naive answer would be that uh, everywhere in Nevada is east of, particularly the coastal cities of California, which are on, right on the west coast. So even if there's a bit of overlap, you'd expect them. Uh, but actually, uh, no. So it, it, it gets correct, but then um, it then gets the reasoning is then wrong, is it, because it then says the western border... Uh, it's got the two uh, meridians here, uh, but this uh, first meridian is actually east of the second meridian, um, and therefore it's, it, it's got it wrong. Uh, in fact, actually, the, the, the way it's normally phrased is, uh, is Reno east or, we so say here's Reno up here, and here's San Diego down here, and you see, because of the way the coast of California really cuts in, actually, Reno is definitely west of, of Reno. And again, if it's looking up stuff on, on, on the web, it ought to be able to do that. You know, it just looks up the lat long for each of them. And I have had conversations where it gets it right. Um, so, okay, those are all, all the examples I want to run through. So, let me just, in my final minutes of the, of the talk, let me just uh, talk, sort of go up a level of abstraction. Um, I just wanted to point out this paper by Ernie Davis on Archive, which has appeared, uh, I think, January this year, if I remember correctly, or maybe it was February. So, where he's talking about benchmarks for common sense reasoning and what's out there. And he starts off with this survey of what common sense knowledge is and it's not. Um, so, it, it is really common. It's not something any specialist knowledge for. It's largely sort of sensible rather than being sort of specialist. Uh, <coughs> you'd have to be able to reason. It's not just about knowledge. That last example wasn't really about reasoning. It was uh, really just about knowledge. And so, I wouldn't really claim that was c common sense knowledge. Um, <coughs> is independent of any particular modality or task, has broad scope, uh, is, is, is distinct from common knowledge, which is, you know, things like London is a city in England, um, or that, uh, you know, Spain is on the west, uh, sorry, Valencia is on the east coast of Spain, perhaps. Um, uh, as concerned with generalities rather than individuals, is not book learning, and so forth. Um, so he then produces a set, a set of desiderata for benchmarks, um, uh, which kind of you know, should be easy for people. They're supposed to be common sense. The language should not be, not be neutral. Um, shouldn't incorporate undesirable biases or stereotypes. Easy to evaluate with a clear-cut criteria of uh, correctness. And, uh, and he gives various examples then of common sense march, benchmarks which depart from these desiderata. So we're probably still looking out on the lookout for, uh, for the ideal or a set of ideal benchmarks. Um, raises these, um, you know, for general issues, should data sets be large or clean? Is it better to have a larger data set but we'll have some wrong labeling in it or is it better to have a small, really clean data set? And with the, you know, the original Winograd schema challenge data set was actually relatively small, only about 250 examples, but it, you know, everything in there was, was correct and supposed to be Google-proof. Um, should, should it be beating the current AI system via goal? Um, uh, should it test sets be secret or published? Um, and so he uh, discusses these things. And he has, has analyzes a whole set of existing benchmarks, and um, he, he gives a point to that there on the paper. And he concludes with a set of recommendations that you really want high quality rather than large, focus on foundational common sense reasoning rather than comes common encyclopedia or expert knowledge. And we really want to extend existing benchmarks to have much greater structural richness and complexity. Uh, I think this is the future probably, you know, I don't actually see foundation models, large language models as being the one answer to AGI, to artificial intelligence. intelligence you know. I've seen many, been around AI long enough, as Jose said, that I've seen many claim solutions to AI in the past. 
you know, Bayesian reasoning and expert systems and everything. And so it, it's not going to be a single thing which is going to, uh, so we need to have multiple different kinds of techniques. Um, and so I think this is one thing that I'm, I'm interested in working on in the future. And indeed, other people are already working on it. We had one paper in, in cognitive systems, advancing cognitive systems um, conference earlier, or late last year. I think, how do we use these models? I mean, I think it's perhaps a comparison with self-driving cars. If you look at the Tesla website, um, and it says explicitly, you know, autopilot enables you to steer, accelerate, brake within your active supervision, assisting with the most burdensome parts of driving. So the Tesla website is not advocating self, the self-drive mode as completely autonomous. You should be in remain control. Uh, it's interesting to note that when you save the, um, the chat GPT conversations into uh, markup mode, it actually is labeled rather than with the sort of two little icons, it's then labeled human and assistant. So it's clearly seeing the, hum the, the system as being your assistant rather than being something more equal or autonomous. And so this was my proposed text then for a rewrite of the Tesla website for uh, language models. So what are foundation models for? I think there's still an open question as what they really can be used for. But clearly, I mean, it's a major step of change in functionality in AI. I mean, it's, it's amazing, the syntactic fluency. But you can't necessarily be relied on to be, well, not generate hallucinations or afactual, as I sometimes prefer to say. There's this paper by Bender et al. about surprisingly impressive fluent, but they're stochastic parrots. Um, and so, you know, they clearly can be a useful tool people are using. You know, Microsoft are using, uh, using ChatGPT in their customer service department to compose draft emails to reply to customer queries. So you know, they're all out there being used already. Many students are probably using it to do their homework, uh, unfortunately. So we, we should be, as a human you know, kind, we should be careful. So in conclusion, finally, uh, just set of strengths uh, and limitations. Um, I think you know, th th there are benefits for this, but of course, it's particularly this issue about uh, it's, 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 um, it's very human intensive and hard to automate. So we'll, I've been thinking about how to at least partially automate this, perhaps using synthetic uh, worlds. Or I was talking to you yesterday with Jose about the possibility of using LLMs themselves in part of the automation, perhaps to help suggest questions. Um, that's it. Um, um, future work, um, I'll just leave that up there and stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, now For questions, uh, have any question from the audience? Okay. About, but oh. yeah. What? No, but it's for the recording. So what are the kind of conclusions you can draw from this kind of evaluation, uh, dialectic evaluation? You mean the, 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 uh, what kind of conclusion would it be possible to draw in general or from the particular evaluations that I've done so far? Um, both. <laughs> okay, so from the particular uh, ones I've done so far is that um, the, no, depending even the same underlying engine, like ChatGPT4, ChatGPT3.5, you get different, depending on the sort of the, the scaffolding around it, whether it's the playground version or the, the, the web version, uh, you get different answers. So, you know, the same underlying inference engine can give you di different kinds of answers, which might be right or wrong, or more extensive or shorter. To the playground version, the answers tend to be shorter than the, the ChatGPT um, versions. Um, so, so, and, and you know, they, they can often get, you know, it's, it's the unreliability, the unpredictability, which, you know, has been, uh, I'm not the first person to have said that. Uh, you know, you, they can get things very right and produce very fluent and correct answers. And then the next question you ask them is that they get it wrong. And clearly at the moment, they're still not able to take on board ongoing advice. You know, and they give it feedback not by the thumbs up, thumbs down button, but by saying, no, your previous answer was wrong, and it can't take that, even though it's obviously in its context, it not, doesn't seem to be able to make use of that information in then answering subsequent questions. Um, and I guess in, so in terms of general, um, so that if, you know, is the question, is this a good way of doing 
evaluation. I'm clearly, you know, doing the other kinds of evaluation where you just have large benchmarks and you run lots of tests. You know, I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing that. Of course not. I mean, uh, that's useful. But I don't think that's the only thing we should be doing uh, because those things can give a misleading impression and you don't get a good feeling. I mean, if, if according to the paper Ryan was first author on and everybody actually published all of their tr the, the, the uh, instance data and then you could actually start doing some more um, checking on the actual results and, and the results on the instance data, then that would make it a bit better and that would be interesting for, for evaluation. But if they're just reporting aggregate results, and we as ordinary mere academics don't have the computational resources to run all the um, results that some other people do, it makes it much harder. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. At least to me, has been clearly interesting and inspiring. Thank you, Jose, for organizing this kind of, of events. It's a shame that there are not plenty of people, but when our, the agendas of people sometimes are very complex. But it's really a, sh it's really a shame that we don't uh, take advantage of having you here and, and participating in, in, in your share of knowledge. So. Let me, yes, I wanted to wait for the end because uh, my, my, my expert is in conceptual modeling I mean for information systems engineering. So, well, what I, I cannot enter in details. Of course, it, for the, the chat GPT wave, uh, we are in the middle of this uh, big uh, dis uh, disruptive uh, appearance of these technologies and everybody is just uh, doing that. Let me just start by the end because it's interesting to me, you know, in, in our field in information system engineering, when you create a, a software, a product, uh, it's very hard to test it. So it's, a, it's, it's amazing to me that I did the product and we all are testing it uh, for free. And we are making a test of high quality as you do. So do you have some kind of reflection of that? Should the, shouldn't you get some part of the benefit of uh, chat? is uh, getting because you are testing the product and you are indicating them how to improve it. Is it, is it, is it, uh, is it a right reflection? Well, I mean, the, the, uh, the, uh, the argument I've heard people make, the argument, the reason people, the uh, OpenAI released ChatGPT3 uh, Chat was that they knew it was flawed, but they wanted to go and get you know, the feedback. I mean, Jose was just reminding, you know, saying this to me yesterday. Uh, you know, it's a free way of getting, you know, thousands and millions of hours of of um, feedback for free, much higher quality than you'd probably get from Amazon Turk. Uh, and that was then enabled them to use you know, 3.5 and then uh, ChatGPT4. So yes, um, I mean, they did have a red team, which most of those people got, got paid. But you know, that was probably a relatively small number of people. Um, the, I mean, okay, you know, if, if I'm, a, you know, to a certain extent, I don't you know, mind doing it for free because you know, these things are out there and they're going to be used. And therefore, if they're going to be out there, I prefer they're going to be good rather than flawed. And therefore, anything I can do to help these things get better is probably better because otherwise people may rely on them and you know, then make errors which could be you know, financially bad or you know, in other ways bad. Uh, so you know, in some sense, that's, that's um, yeah, a reasonable thing to be doing. Uh, but you're right, it is very different to something like a car where, you know, the, a car manufacturer actually doesn't release a faulty, you know, first motion one prototype, sell it to the public, or even give it many copies away of the car uh, to, for free and say, test it, uh, and let me know how many times you're going to end up in hospital. Um, you know, so it, it is, I mean, of course, there, the, the consequences of something going wrong with your un not well-tested car are much potentially worse than here, where providing you uh, uh, um, not taking full, you know, not basing important life decisions on it. I mean, the barred version you use it clearly says at the top left, experimental version or something like that. So that is emphasizing. Well, thank you. There are many things I would like to discuss with you, but let me just choose only one that is related to what we do normally. We have been talking in the past, for instance, about uh, an automated the, 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 the programming machine. And it is a machine that you tell the machine what kind of program you want, uh, and you have it. And only 10 years ago, this was a kind of, of uh, crazy idea that now, with this kind of technologies, is, is, is very feasible. It's, it's approaching, uh, it's, it's becoming a kind of real, a real possibility. And also, this is why many of us now, we are, well, we say that we are working now with Hossein, uh, 
AI Institute. I have never in my life did the AI before, but now we are saying that we do explainable AI because we try to, our conceptual modeling work is based on conceptualizing reality. So we try, we defend always the idea that, that to have a, a good application, you need to understand the semantic, the, the, the description of the world in a common sense way. I, it, is, it is amazing to me that you use the common sense uh, word. Uh, well, it's, a, it's a very important topic indeed. You just introduced my question was, what, what do you really mean by common sense? Because for us, it's very hard to identify ontologically speaking to have a foundational definition of common sense. And without it, it is very hard to continue. But you, you, you also have, you also face this problem. So my these last comments were, well, is, is, you know, we have a Spanish saying that says something like the common sense is the less, le, the less common of senses. Eh? In, in the sense that it's, it's, it's very hard to understand what is common sense. And also the, the, the point related to that uh, is uh, that, uh, well, what is a, you talk about foundation model when you, 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 see, you see the world model, all my radars are on because we work with models. So this is my last part of the comment that I wanted to share with you. Is common sense uh, really, ontologically speaking, uh, is possible to define it precisely? And what do you mean also by a foundation model when you say that in, in, in LLM are a kind of foundation model? Okay, lots of comments. I don't think I remember all of them, but let me list the last two ones, which I do remember. Um, so the first of all, the easy one, the foundation model at LLM. So an LLM is a kind of foundation model, but not all foundation models are LLMs. So it's the kind of, you know, so for example, a multimodal system which includes both language and vision wouldn't strictly be just a language model, but it would, might be a foundation model. Okay, so then the de definition of common sense. Well, I don't believe there's a harm, you know, there's, it's not something that's a definable category. Uh, you know, there's some things which I could say are definite examples of common sense and other ones which are definitely not, but there's going to be this kind of blurry line separating the two, and you might say that's common sense, I might say it's not. You know, maybe there also might be things like age-dependent and culture-dependent. Uh, you know, diff different cultures might regard something as common sense or not. I mean, I would hope generally common sense, particularly because spatial knowledge, would be culture-independent. But, you know, I, I can imagine it might not be completely culture-independent. So, you know, I'm not going to pretend that there's a hard and fast uh, clear cut, you know, the world is separated into common sense knowledge and, or common sense reasoning and non you know, expert uh, uh, reasoning and knowledge. So, but there's clearly things on the back. And it's possible also that, particularly for the common sense part of it, uh, so the, the, the knowledge part of it rather than the reasoning part of it, uh, I suspect stuff kind of moves from the expert to the kind of the common part. So things that, I mean, two years ago, well, even one year ago, ask, uh, I remember the general public what a large language model and people would have just looked at you blankly. And now, you know, it's on BBC News every other day. Uh, you know, so, you know, so at least in terms of what's common, common knowledge does change clearly o over time. Uh, whilst things t it tends not to move, it tends, does it ever move in the other direction? I can't think of a good example of it moving in, in the other direction. It would seem counterintuitive to me. Yeah. Uh, so my question is about uh, the fact that you uh, said uh, different versions of chat, uh, GPT, for example, Playground and Chat, chat GPT ha have different answers. Uh, so if this is the case, uh, the answers of this system is unreliable in a way. And uh, also it's hard to evaluate this system because uh, one of them might be correct and the other one wrong. And uh, it might be the case that if you ask the same question in a different uh, time, then you get a different answer. So uh, do you think, because you have uh, did all these experiments, do you think that uh, this is going to make it hard to evaluate these uh, models? Because it, it's, it might be a matter of chance that you get all the uh, answers correct or wrong in different uh, time that you ask uh, these questions. Yeah, I mean, of course, these things are probabilistic in, in it's stochastic in any case. So, uh, you know, it produces an answer and then it chooses the most probable answer for that can change. And then uh, and maybe, I'm not sure, maybe some of these models actually then maybe don't always choose the most probable answer. And certainly with BARD, you can actually, there's a number of, it, it can say, you know, choose a different answer explicitly says, oh, for ChatGPT4, you can say regenerate it, it'll produce you a different answer. Um, 
Yes, I mean, there are, there are, they, you can get different answers for different kinds of reasons. Um, sometimes they're just rephrasings. It's basically giving you the same answer, but it explains it in a different way or rephrases it in a different way. Um, but sometimes it'll give you a completely different answer, which might be wrong or right. Um, I mean, in a certain sense, you've seen that already, because sometimes I've asked a particular question, re-asked it a bit later on, and then it might get it wrong, or at least uh, get, suddenly it will give you a, a, a difference. Or sometimes it will give it exactly the same answer, and sometimes it will just rephrase it. So, but that's, of course, that's also true on humans. I mean, they're probably, you know, if I ask you the same question today and tomorrow, or if you ask me that question today and tomorrow, I'll probably give you a slightly different version of the answer. So, you know, I, d I don't, that stochasticity I don't mind per se, it's the kind of the qualitative, you know, whether it's sort of qualitatively saying the right things and explaining things. Um, and that explanation is kind of really critical because that's, I mean, the, these large language models and neural, neural models in general, there's the trouble they're, they're black boxes and there's the whole thing about explainable AI. And we, we need to find good ways in order to build trust in these systems. We need to be able to have we need to have trust in them that they're going to reliably give us right answers. And one way of having trust in them is that they can explain their reasoning to us. And that's, you know, that's not easy, particularly to gain that trust, particularly when, and as you've seen examples here today, when it then gives you uh, an answer which might be correct, but it, it's, it, the explanation's wrong or vice versa, it gives you uh, the right answer, but actually the explanation is wrong. So, you know, uh, and so it particularly, I mean, sometimes it's interesting, and actually, I don't know, I don't think I pointed that out. Uh, one of the examples, I think, in the, um, the three in a row example, um, because I was trying not to spend the whole of the time on that, <laughs> that one example, but I thought it was interesting to go through that extended conversation. Um, it actually it actually gives the wrong answer to begin with, and then it starts explaining it. And then as it starts explaining it, it says, oh, hang on, I've got it wrong. Um, and then so it then it gives me a different answer at the end. Um, and so I, I, I sort of, it, it's interesting because it means that it is able to introspect on its own, int own explanation uh, and then realize that it, what that they now can got predicts what it said earlier. But, um, that, has that answered your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this example is very interesting. Uh, is it included in your paper? The, the only ones that were included in the paper were the very f was the things at the beginning about Tom and Ray throwing the bag. Um, the what was the other example? The shape sorter. And there was one, the third example, there was, uh, I can't remember what the other example I did near the beginning of the paper, the beginning of the talk. That the first three examples were in the paper, all the rest of stuff I've been doing this week. Um, well, the, yes, it's possible the polar example might be, no, I don't think, it, no, it's not in there, I don't think so. The, no, I think those are, those are the only one that's in the paper. And the other, I was trying to, I basically, I was, uh, I was sort of interested, the, the, the paper is not about geospatial reasoning at all, it's just about other kinds of spatial reasoning. So I was sort of starting to try to write a paper about geospatial reasoning. And so I was then focusing on, that's why I did the Lake District one and the sort of the shores of the lake and the northwest, east, south and so forth. Um, there's, there's a de paper deadline on Monday, I don't think I'm going to make it. Uh, but uh, that, was kind of the, that was kind of the task. There's a poster I could, maybe, I could probably still put in. Um, so I was focusing on that geospatial stuff, and I thought I'd make that the main focus um, of that, apart from the, the three in a row one, which I, I just looked at, because I, I was look, then actually searched for all the spatial reasoning examples in that database of failures, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I'll, I just, I was you know, surprised how, how bad it was at that. But maybe, as I say, maybe it's not being fair because it's diagrammatic reasoning, and that's kind of hard. But it, the point is, it looks like it can do it. And this is the trouble. Humans are, the, what's the, what's, there's a word for it, when you, you sort of, you, there's this anthropomorphism goes out, where something looks like it's human, you then tend to believe it is a human, you ascribe qualities to it that it doesn't actually have. 
And so because it looks like it's conversing to you in that, it's great fluent language, and therefore you think that it's, I mean, even going back all the days to Weizenbaum, Joseph Weizenbaum and Eliza many, many years ago, and his secretary was there, was there playing with the, with the system, and yeah, she thought she was really talking to a person, because it had this fluency, and it seemed to give her sort of good answers. And so she was ascribing a much greater level of intelligence, even though it's just an incredibly simple rule-based system, which just looked for keywords in the questions and spouted stuff back. Or said, you know, go on, tell me more if it couldn't think of anything else to say. Thank you. So I was worried because, uh, yeah, maybe Ryan was eager to speak, but uh, uh, we have decided that we are going to have a very short break. If you want to go to the toilet or something, just very short break, less than five minutes, and then we start with the next talk. Uh, but I wanted to ask a final question, and, uh, and maybe this is something that we can continue discussion after Ryan's talk because maybe it's a little bit philosophical. But I really like the the uh, the problem of, of evaluating a language model, a proper language model, not a general foundation model that could be multi-model on spatial reasoning, because this comes back to discussions about how far you can reach with a system that is not embodied. Right. And this comes back to Plato's cavern. So it's not something like the old discussions in, in AI. It's old discussions about philosophy, how far you can understand a world that you cannot interact with. So what do you think that there's some limits with these? So or things are going to change significantly when we start just using images, for instance, with, with GPT-4? Or maybe in the future you have a proper, and this is going to relate to the next talk, where we are going to discuss a little more about embodied agents, perhaps? What do you think about this? I think that clearly is going to help. I mean, I, mean, I, I drew the diagrams for some of those northwest, east, south of all things towards the end. And you know, that's the way I actually worked it out. I, didn't, I actually checked the answer by drawing a diagram and then looked to see whether the starting point was you know, which direction it was, because that was the easiest way for me to do it. So that kind of diagrammatic reasoning. And that's a, there's a whole body, there's a, there's a whole conference uh, series of diagrammatic reasoning. So it's kind of its, it's own separate subfield of AI which doesn't use, it's all symbolic, it doesn't use neural, net, neural models at all. Um, but, you know, if people are saying that these kind of neural models are going to produce AGI, which I don't believe, not, not without additional stuff, um, then you know, it's going to have to do that, this kind of stuff as well. And it, again, the three in a row example is much easier if you sort of actually draw it out. And it's, it's obviously it's seeing this, well, we see the dynamics produced, but it's not actually... Well, we don't know what it's doing, but it certainly looks like it's not really understanding the diagram it's drawn. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a firm, but I mean, I, some of the work I've done uh, in my career has been on robotics. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a firm believer in it, sort of embodied AI and having, you know, having these systems grounded in. I've done work on grounding language division, for example, as well, and trying to learn the meaning of language by, there was an AIJ paper last year, or was it two years ago now? Um, last year, I think, um, on gr ground, learning how to ground language from, from, from revision sort of in a bottom-up uh, fashion, but using a sort of correlation-based approach. Uh, and so, and you can then get a much more robust um, grounding and, and definitions of your language by having it grounded in vision, rather than me trying to tell the system, rather than the system learning what... Uh, left of or large or small or near or anything means by reading, it can actually see that by the combination of the language and scenes in which the red object is described as being near or to the left of the blue object. And it can, it can get a, you know, uh, and you can expect the model that we built and you can actually see that it's, that it's, got, it's understood the meaning of it properly. But no, I, I completely agree. And so I, I'm really looking for, I'm very frustrated I don't have access to multimodal GPT-4 yet. Thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> we, we will be able to follow the discussion after Ryan's talk. Now, while we set up, maybe you want to go, uh, but uh, we'll start in uh, two or three minutes. Just as a final thing, this, I didn't put this in the talk, but, that, but this, you can get ChatGPT to play chess badly. And there was this appeared on Twitter, and it's there's this move. It suggests moving the the rook from uh, A8 to uh, G um, G8, and um, it, it suddenly suggests it should be called the atheist move because it, it doesn't acknowledge the existence of the bishop. 
Right, let me um, stop that and find Ryan's.
this is working yeah okay okay so welcome back uh so now it's uh Another pleasure as well to have the second uh, speaker, uh, Ryan Burnell. Uh, he is currently at the uh, Leverhulst Center for the Future of Intelligence at the University of Cambridge before he was associated with the center at, at Imperial. Uh, he's transitioning in the following months to the Tunis Institute and he's going to work with, with uh, Tony in the future. So yeah, uh, yeah, uh, over to you. So uh, <laughs> thank you for, for being here. Thanks, Jose. Thanks for organizing this, and uh, thanks, Tony, for a really great talk. I have a lot of questions, if, as I was saying, that maybe we can talk about during the, the discussion time. I think Tony's talk was a really great deep dive into evaluating one specific ability of these foundation models, and you kind of highlighted the complexity of even just understanding one capability in these systems. And what I'm going to do in this talk is kind of take a step back a little bit and focus on how we can figure out what are the kinds of abilities we want to be evaluating, and then how we can go about uh, designing tasks to do that. So uh, first of all, I just want to say that this is not all of my work. This is the work that's been done with Jose and the, the rest of the, the team at Cambridge. This has been a very collaborative effort. And uh, a lot of the kind of introductory stuff that I was going to talk about, Tony's uh, already covered. But you know, we know that these AI systems are incredibly important. They're becoming used in almost every domain of life. and one thing that Tony didn't talk about too much is the potential for these systems to be used in problematic ways. So we know that these systems can be exploited by bad actors. We're seeing lots of headlines all the time about different ways these models might be used in, in problematic ways. And you may have also seen in the news a lot recently, people are starting to talk more about the possibility of these systems posing an existential threat to humanity, you know, with the, one of the kind of godfathers of AI leaving Google and warning about some of these threats. And I love this XKCD comic that kind of sums it up. Uh, to prove you're a human, click on all the places you would hide during a, a robot uprising, right? So we really don't want these kinds of situations to, to happen. And so we need to figure out how we can make sure we keep a handle on them. And if we want to be able to uh, keep a handle on these systems, but also if we want to continue moving towards general purpose systems, then we need to be able to evaluate these systems robustly because if you don't understand what the systems are capable of or, or what their limitations are, first of all, it's hard to figure out how you might improve them, but it's also hard to figure out whether they are in line with any kind of regulations that you might be putting in place. So we really need to understand these systems well. And you know, with things like ChatGPT, we're starting to see some of the problems with when these systems are not very robust in different ways, uh, they can lead to really weird behavior if these systems aren't properly evaluated and we, we don't really understand where they're gonna go wrong. So, let's kind of take a, an overview of what evaluation has looked like in AI and maybe how it can be improved going forward. So I'm gonna make a claim that evaluation used to be relatively straightforward. In the, in the early days of AI, most systems were pretty narrow. They were kind of designed to perform one single task or a relatively small set of tasks. So this deep blue system was designed to play chess, so that's all it could do. It couldn't solve spatial reasoning problems. It couldn't do anything else. And so it, when you're evaluating this kind of narrow system, you can evaluate it relatively easily by just, you have a very well-defined task, and then you can evaluate how well it does on various instances of that task. But now with these more general systems like the ChatGPT and these other foundation models, evaluation is becoming much, much harder because these systems can perform a wide range of different tasks, maybe a, an undefined set of tasks, and we need to understand where they're gonna perform well, where they're gonna perform Fully, uh, ChatGPT is a great example. We're also starting to see more of these kind of multimodal systems that can take in lots of different kinds of data and perform lots of different sorts of tasks. So how can we go about evaluating those tasks? Uh, the, the other kind of complexity, com complexity adding thing here is that these systems are becoming capable of really complex behaviors and things that kind of appear like the complex cognition that we see in humans and other animals. So, you know, we're seeing questions being asked in the public domain about are these systems sentient, you know, are they conscious, what are their cognitive abilities, and we're even seeing this within the machine learning community, you know, there's this famous case of the Google engineer who's claimed that uh, this, this model is sentient as well. So people are starting to ask these questions about the complex cognitive capabilities of these systems, and we don't have great ways of, of answering these questions. Uh, and, and in order to answer them, we need to be able to evaluate what these systems can do. And so it's become clear to everyone in the community that single task evaluation is, is no longer sufficient and there's 
there's a lot of limitations of doing that. You can, can't really get a sense of the broad capabilities of a system from any one task. And so there's been this shift to using evaluation benchmarks, which are collections of multiple different tasks, usually covering similar kinds of domains. Uh, and these systems, these benchmarks are really great because they allow you to get a much broader sense of what the capabilities of a system are. But there are still a lot of limitations of them. And one of these is that these benchmarks are often constructed based on available data sets that are out there. They're not necessarily constructed in a, a systematic way. And that can make it a little more difficult to actually uh, figure out where the gaps are in our knowledge of these systems. So some examples of some benchmarks, this is probably very familiar to all of you, so I won't spend too much time of it, but a kind of an early uh, benchmark in AI, it was this ImageNet challenge, a massive data set of, of various kinds of labeled images and an associated challenge with it that tested the ability of, of vision systems to identify and recognize various different kinds of objects. Uh, and this led to some really big advancements in, in these kinds of models. And more recently, we're seeing much bigger benchmarks, such as Big Bench, which includes 200 plus tasks measuring uh, the capabilities of these different language models. This was constructed through a public call for tasks, and I know that uh, some of the team here at UPV also contributed to this benchmark. Uh, it included a wide variety of different tasks, everything from comprehension and reasoning through to sort of more niche things about understanding chess or understanding uh, sports. A couple of just quick examples of a question testing general knowledge, uh, also more getting kind of more cognitive skills like an understanding of cause and effect, so which of these sentences makes more sense, it started raining because the driver turned the wipers on, or the driver turned the wipers on because it started raining. And you can kind of see this task is more akin to the sorts of things Tony's doing, really trying to tap into a specific kind of, of ability here. So these benchmarks, as I said, they're much better than taking a, a single task approach and they include really rich data. But the weaknesses are that they're not always systematic and it can be really complicated to condense the data from these big benchmarks into meaningful conclusions. So if we come back to Big Bench, this includes performance data from over 200 different language tasks. How do we use all of that data to actually make conclusions about what the system can do and what it can't do and where it might be safe to deploy? Well, one way would be we kind of look at each task separately and go, okay, it does well on this task, it does poorly on this task, et cetera. But if you do that, now you have 200 plus metrics, even if you only use one metric per task, and how are you gonna figure out what to do with all of that, that data? It's a, you, you get a picture that's really unwieldy, and it can also be hard to see the bigger picture. So what are the kind of kinds of tasks that the system struggles with? What are the kinds of tasks that it does well? So that approach doesn't seem ideal. Uh, an alternative is we can do aggregation. So we can kind of aggregate across all these different tasks and come up with some overall metric of how well the system performs on the benchmark. And this is advantageous in that it's very simple. It's kind of easy to compare across systems. This system got 70% on the benchmark. This system got 75. Maybe this one seems better. But the flip side of it is that this overall metric, this aggregate metric that you get is really difficult to interpret and, and it lacks a lot of granularity. So although this system might have got 75 and we can say that it's better than the system that got 70, where is it gonna do well? Where is it gonna do badly? Where is it safe to deploy? It's really hard to find out those answers. So clearly this aggregation approach alone also doesn't really, isn't really sufficient. And it kind of seems like what we need is some kind of middle ground between these two because you know, this aggregation approach also assumes that all the tasks are tapping into the same constructs it weights every task equally. So if I, as, as I mentioned in, with Big Bench, we have reasoning tasks, but we also have uh, tasks about understanding chess. And if you aggregate all of your data together, then you're kind of implicitly saying that the ability of Big Bench to understand chess is just as important as its ability to reason. And that's a, you know, a decision that we should at least think about rather than kind of automatically just uh, assume, making these assumptions. Uh, the other thing is these benchmarks, the, the aggregation approach, it doesn't allow you to predict the performance of a, a system in a particular situation based on just that aggregate. So, okay, maybe some kind of middle ground approach is going to be more informative, but what might that middle ground approach actually look like? Well, I suggest here that, first of all, we, we need some aggregation or at least some way of reducing the complexity in these benchmarks so that we can ultimately make decisions, but we also need a way of preserving the granularity in the conclusions that we can draw. And that means that we need some meaningful way of aggregating results that allows us to preserve that granularity while also uh, reducing some complexity. And, and I think that the one useful tool in that kind of toolbox is to take a cognitive approach to evaluating these systems. 
Now, what I mean by that is we can, instead of kind of building these benchmarks bottom up based on available data sets or available tasks that we know these systems can be used for, is starting from kind of a top-down approach and thinking about what are the important cognitive abilities that we might expect these systems to have or we might want them to have, and then we can kind of build tasks to evaluate those cognitive abilities. And the advantage of doing this is that it provides a really kind of natural way of aggregating results. You know that you have these constructs that you want to measure, and you can aggregate together the tasks that want to measure these different constructs. Uh, and when I say aggregation here, I don't necessarily mean just taking a simple average, but we can at least kind of get, form some conclusion about each of these different abilities that we know we want to measure. Uh, and I think this will allow us to have more systematic benchmarks, also more efficient benchmarks, because we know exactly what we want to measure. We can have the tasks in the benchmarks that measure those tasks, and we don't have to have uh, all these other tasks in there. Kind of, I think things like Big Bench are taking a bit of a scattergun approach. Let's throw a bunch of tasks at it, and hopefully that will give us a bigger se a sense of what this thing can do, when maybe we didn't need all that task. Maybe the chess understanding task or the sports understanding task isn't actually all that informative for a lot of the things we need. So a good example of this is if we take something like Big Bench, uh, Big Bench has 17 different tasks measuring causal reasoning, but only two tasks measuring physical reasoning. Why is that the case? We, you know, we probably don't need 17 tasks to measure causal reasoning, or, or if we do, why do we only have two tasks measuring physical reasoning? You know, I think these are the kinds of decisions that are, that are not thought about carefully when, when it, based on the current approach to benchmark construction, but if we start from a top-down approach and we go, okay, we want to understand causal reasoning, we want to understand physical reasoning, now let's make sure we have good coverage of both of, both of those tasks, then I think our benchmarks would look very different. And it can also help us make sure that we're not missing anything. So maybe there are some tasks or some abilities that are not being tested in Big Bench that actually we need to be testing. And the only way to kind of realize that is to take this high-level approach and think about the things we care about measuring. So that's the kind of overview of this approach, but how are we gonna actually go about uh, doing it? I think there are three main steps. The first one is you need to specify the abilities that you want to evaluate. The second step is then you wanna design tasks to evaluate those abilities. And then as I briefly mentioned, you need to figure out how to kind of aggregate performance together or at least make some inferences about performance on each of those abilities. I'm gonna talk now uh, about each of these in different steps, starting with how we specify the abilities we want to evaluate. Here I think we can take a lot of inspiration from cognitive science because cognitive scientists and psychologists have spent decades investigating the structure of cognition in humans and animals and they've developed empirically grounded theories of cognition and also tasks that we can use to uh, measure those abilities. And they've, they've also investigated the relationships between these different abilities and performance on different kinds of real world domains or different kinds of real world tasks. So if we're thinking about a specific task and trying, trying to understand whether a system might be uh, safe or effective in a given domain, then we can kind of draw on some of these relationships that have been already uh, investigated in, in cognitive science. There are two really separate types of models that we can draw from in trying to figure out the abilities we want to measure. The first of these are psychometric models. These are models that are developed by giving uh, a population of people a wide variety of different tasks, and then just looking at how those tasks fit together. Uh, so kind of looking at the individual differences across different people. The most famous of these models is known as the kettlehorn carroll model. And basically what it does is it identifies, if we, if we give people a large task battery of tasks that are kind of designed to measure intelligent behavior, we can look at how those tasks tend to fit together and what we find is that they tend to fit into these kind of small, small number of latent capabilities that can explain a lot of the variance in performance across a range of tasks. So things like uh, fluid reasoning and uh, memory, processing speed, things like that. And so maybe these are the kinds of abilities we might also want to be measuring in AI systems, or maybe we want to take a similar approach in AI and do these, this kind of analysis with AI systems to try and extract the latent capabilities that we find in, in systems like these large language models. Uh, and we've been, Jose and I have been working on some, uh, some work doing exactly this kind of thing. The other kind of model we can draw from are what we might call cognitive models. Rather than just being kind of bottom up based on what patterns you find in the data, these are developed in a, an iterative way based on a variety of different types of data, data from experiments, behavioral experiments, neuroscience, developmental data of how abilities change over time, and also from looking at uh, data from animals as well in many cases. So a kind of classic example of one of these models would be one of the more simple ones is this 
taxonomy of long-term memory in humans, and what you do if you run different experiments on the kinds of uh, ways people remember information, what you can find is you can separate out a lot of these different kinds of memory, so that, okay, someone who has, does really well, has a really good episodic memory, which is their memory for events and experiences of their life, doesn't necessarily have a good semantic memory, a memory for facts. So we can kind of dissociate these different abilities and show that they are separable. And that gives us a sense of that, that these are separate constructs that we want to measure uh, separately in, in, in humans, and we can do a similar kind of thing in, in AI systems. And we even get all the way from this to these much more complex sort of speculative models that try and explain the different interactions between uh, all of these things. And maybe there's some insights we can draw from those as well, but those are probably much more likely to be very specific to the, the kind of system we're measuring. So as I mentioned, I think we can start to adapt and draw from these models and use them to help us build uh, benchmarks in AI. They, they might not be perfect, but they give us a sense of the kinds of things we might want to measure. Uh, and we can also use them to start building theories of AI cognition. I think one of the things that's really been lacking in the field is, a, is actually a theoretical understanding of how the abilities of, of AI systems are structured and that building those theories is gonna be really important for our ability to predict uh, and explain the behavior of these systems. Having said that, there are many limitations of drawing from cognitive science. First of all, there are gaps and disagreements within the cognitive literature, so we don't fully understand human cognition, and so there are still some kind of question marks there that will also be question marks if we then go to apply these theories to AI systems. There are also many differences between AIs and, and humans. Uh, you know, there are differences in structure. Human cognition relies on the brain, whereas the AI system's cognition depends on the, the, the structure of the model, uh, and these can be very different. There are also many differences in senses, so we've kind of talked already about the fact that language models don't have any other, you know, kind of modality of information beyond language. Something like a self-driving car might also have senses that we don't have as humans, things like LiDAR. Uh, and the way these systems get information is also very different to humans. So when humans see, uh, get language or, or numbers, they get this information through their vision, through vision or through hearing it, whereas AI systems often get this information kind of directly into the model. And that means we might expect differences in how these systems process information relative, relative to humans. So these differences are really important to keep in mind, and I'm definitely not suggesting we'll expect to see the exact same structure of abilities in, in AI as we do in humans, but I think that uh, these, these models from psychology, theories from psychology, provide a really useful starting point. You know, we need to start somewhere uh, in building these theories, and I think that cognitive science is a really good place to start. And perhaps more importantly, I think we, we need to start now. Uh, as I mentioned, these questions about the capabilities of AI systems are happening now. People want to know, does the system have reasoning, common sense reasoning? Does it have uh, a, you know, a, a good memory? All these different kinds of things. What is the extent of its knowledge? And if we don't have good ways of answering these questions, then we're in trouble because the public's not gonna know how to deal with them. Regulators aren't not gonna know how to deal with them. Policymakers aren't gonna know how to deal with them. So we need to answer these questions uh, and we need to start somewhere even if it's not perfect. So one of the things I've been working on over the last year or so is to build a kind of an initial attempt at combining all of this information that we have from cognitive science into kind of a taxonomy of different abilities that we might be interested in measuring across different AI systems. I'm not expecting you to kind of fully take this in, but just to give you a sense of the fact that we can start to tease apart the different kinds of abilities that we see from cognitive science and think about how, whether these abilities are going to be important for AI systems, what kinds of things they might be important for, and how we can measure them. So that's the first part of this, of this cognitive approach. Once we've specified the abilities we want to evaluate, then the next step is actually designing tasks to evaluate those abilities. And here I think actually cognitive science has a lot to offer as well, you know, because in trying to build theories of human cognition, psychologists have also had to build evaluation tasks to evaluate human cognition. And we can, we can take these tasks and try and adapt a lot of them to, to be used with AI systems. Uh, and we have these kinds of evaluation tasks with humans in many different kinds of formats. So many of these tasks do rely on language and might be really useful for using with, with language models. We also have kind of embodied tasks that require people to 
do things in a physical environment that will be really useful when we start to have more embodied systems. We have kind of decision-based tasks where people just need to make a decision one way or another. And then we, you know, we have lots of different tasks involving different modalities that might be useful for different kinds uh, of systems. So I think there's a really rich body of work here that we can draw on uh, as computer scientists to try and build ways of evaluating AI systems. Uh, and I'm not saying that people aren't doing this at all. Clearly, a lot of inspiration in evaluation tasks comes from cognitive psychology, but I think there's still a lot of untapped potential there to, to build better benchmark tasks. Uh, so going back to this kind of taxonomy that, that I've been working on building, once we've identified these abilities, we can start to now build tasks to measure each of those abilities uh, in different modalities, in different kinds of systems, so that when it, we, we have a new system, we know the kinds of tasks we want to use with it, we know the kinds of things we want to be able to answer. And one of the ways we've been uh, building these tasks as a group is using the animal AI environment. So this is an environment uh, that was created uh, in Unity. It's sort of this virtual 3D environment in which either a person or an AI kind of plays as this small little cute little animal character and it has to go and reach a reward in the environment represented by these little green circles and also the yellow circles. And what we can do is we can just build uh, very simple kind of objects and combine them in different ways to create cognitive tasks that can actually measure quite complex cognitive abilities. Uh, it's a very easy system to configure and we can also procedurally generate instance, different instances uh, in this environment which makes it really suitable for uh, developing broad benchmarks of these systems. So to give you an example of what some of these tasks might look like, if we take something like this task here, which is used to measure inhibition in the, the animal literature, so basically to get this reward inside the tube, the animal has to realize, okay, you can't just go straight ahead because there's a barrier, you have to actually go around. Some animals can do this, some, animal, some animals struggle more, as you can see. Uh, and we can actually build this kind of task, we can build this kind of task in uh, AI systems in our animal AI environment as well, and plug these AI systems into this environment and see how well they do. So this system here at the top doesn't seem to be really behaving in a very intelligent way. It doesn't seem to be understanding uh, that it can't go through this, this barrier. And whereas this system here realizes, okay, maybe it needs to go around. So this is just one example of a task, but it shows you how we can, we can mimic tasks that have been used in cognitive science uh, and use them to, uh, to understand AI systems. And a, a, a broader example of how, how this has been done in our group is, Piaget, which is a big battery of object permanence tasks that I know some of you are familiar with, that has been primarily spearheaded by Cosi Baduris, who is a PhD student at Cambridge. And, uh, and so uh, Cosi's been building a variety of tasks designed to measure object permanence, which is the, the understanding that when an object disappears from view, it doesn't disappear in the virtual, in, it, from your environment, it still exists. So in this task, the uh, reward initially is in view and then it goes behind this wall. And to solve the task, you need to understand there's still a reward there behind the wall and you should go and get it. Uh, and so using this animal AI environment, Cosi's built something like 200 plus thousand different instances based on a few different task paradigms and then uh, supplementing that with procedural generation to build a really robust set of t tasks measuring object permanence ability uh, that kind of uh, avoid a lot of the confounds that you might see in any one task. So maybe in this task, you can solve the task by just going towards the last place you saw something that was green. So maybe that's a strategy that works, but there's a lot of other tasks in this battery where that strategy wouldn't work. And so to do perform well across all of these tasks, you need to actually have this understanding that an object still exists and, and, and know to still go look for it. So that's how, to, uh, how we might evaluate some of these abilities in either embodied systems or systems that can operate in this kind of virtual environment. But as we've heard a lot about already today, it's also really important to understand the abilities of systems like language models, which clearly you can't, well, probably not easily, plug into a system like Animal AI. So there we, we're gonna need different kinds of tasks, uh, but fortunately there are also lots of cognitive tests based around language that can be adapted in a very similar way, but just into different kinds of language tasks. And I think this is especially true of, of different reasoning tasks, which has been a big focus of, of the, the community. So that's step two, uh, designing some tasks to evaluate different abilities. The third step is once you have these tasks and you get some performance data from your system, how do you actually reach some conclusions about the system's capabilities? So how do you aggregate the performance together or at least infer performance uh, to reach some meaningful conclusions? On the face of it, it kind of, kind of seems easy. Okay, if you know you have a bunch of tasks measuring a specific ability, 
aggregate the tasks measuring those capabilities together, and that'll give you a sense of, of the uh, system's performance or capabilities along those lines. But actually, as it turns out, it's, it's a lot more complicated than this, a lot harder to actually get robust uh, understanding of these abilities. And part of the reason for that is that almost every task relies on more than one capability. So if we take that object permanence task that I showed you before, you need to have object permanence, you need to understand that the object still exists, but you also need to have some kind of memory. You need to remember where the object used to be in order to be able to go and get it, and you need to be able to navigate your environment effectively. So there are kind of all these different capabilities that are involved in any one task. So if you find that your system fails on that object permanence task, what does that tell you? It could tell you that maybe the system doesn't have object permanence, but it could also mean that the system doesn't have good enough memory to remember where the object was, or maybe it's just not very good at navigating its environment. So just based on successes and failures alone, you can't necessarily tell all that much about the capabilities of a system unless it's kind of passing everything. Uh, and so we need more complex ways of actually inferring what the causes of these failures are when, it, when, it, when a system uh, doesn't succeed. And so we've been working uh, to kind of develop a method for drawing these kinds of inferences based on complex patterns of task performance across various different kinds of tasks. Uh, and this, if it's been led by John Burden, and we've just uh, submitted a, a paper to ICML with a lot of this methodology. And essentially what we can do, again, I don't expect you to understand what's going on in this diagram, but if we have a bunch of different tasks, we've identified the different kinds of abilities involved in these different tasks, and the relationship between these different capabilities, then what we can start to do is look at the patterns of successes and failures across these different tasks, and using Bayesian inference, infer the most likely reasons for those failures, and use that to get a sense of all of these different capabilities across the whole benchmark of tasks. And so this is where having a big benchmark that measures multiple different abilities can be really useful in, in actually getting a good sense of the capabilities of a system. And the other advantage of this kind of approach is if you can then uh, build an understanding or infer the capabilities of a system, then you can start to predict how well the system will perform uh, on tasks that rely on those capabilities. So if we know that our system has object permanence, it has good memory, it has good ability to navigate the environment, then if we give the system a new object permanence task that relies on all those things, we can predict that the system is going to do very well in a way that it might not be easy to do uh, if we were just using a task-by-task -task evaluation approach. Of course, the caveat here is this kind of requires us to understand what the capabilities are involved in a specific kind of task, and this is uh, part of the focus of uh, a grant that Jose is working on with the OECD to understand, okay, what are the different abilities involved in different kinds of tasks or in different kinds of jobs, uh, because that's really important for our ability to, pr to predict what will happen uh, in the future and, and what, whether these systems will be able to do well on these different kinds of tasks. So it's harder than it, it initially sounds. Uh, stay tuned on how we can do a good job of that. So these are the three main steps to the cognitive approach to AI evaluation, and I think that there are a lot of, of, of benefits to this approach. First of all, I want to say, okay, clearly we need robust evaluation methods. Hopefully that's uh, obvious to everyone. Uh, the, this approach, I think, re re provides a lot of benefits. First of all, it can make it easier for us to figure out how we should construct benchmarks, making them more systematic and potentially more efficient. It can also allow us to make inferences about complex capabilities, and in the era where these systems are developing, developing these complex capabilities, that has begun to become increasingly important uh, as we move forward. Uh, but these are really complex issues. Uh, there's a lot of questions still to be answered, uh, a lot of work still to be done. Uh, but hopefully, we can, if we can move in this direction, we can do a better job of avoiding futures like this one. Thanks very much. Um, questions? All right. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for the amazing talk. I really sure. liked it. So my question is more related to instead of inferring the different cognitive capabilities from the systems, uh, because sometimes you can find those, um, this kind of capability when you have some correlation between the capability of the system and the task performance. But could do you have any conception about creating tests or tasks that you, let's say, certify whether this, there's actually a causal representation between the system having actually this capability and solving this task, rather than some other kind of 
experimental correlation that is actually contributing to this level of curiosity that you are uh, found? Sure. So, so if, I, if I'm right, what you're asking is basically, how can you be sure that the system is solving the task because it has the underlying capability rather than kind of cheating or there's some yeah. other reason yeah. why it's able to perform well on the task? I think it's really challenging. I think uh, we, one thing we really know clearly about these systems is that they're very good at picking up on any regularities in the data, so any unintended things. Tony talked a bit before about the Winograd schema. There's a lot of kind of unintentional things that might be in the data set that can allow the system to perform well even if it doesn't have the underlying capability. And I think that's why it's really important when you're evaluating a specific kind of ability, that you have multiple different tests that get at that same ability, and that those tests have different structures and different kind of uh, different properties, so that if, let's say, the system just understands the relationships between you know, cars and speed or something like that, so you have another test of the same ability where that kind of relationship won't be effective in solving the task. And if you find that your, ta your system performs well across these range of various different tasks that all rely on the same capability, then you can have a better sense that probably the reason that it's doing well is because it has that capability. Now, it's still possible that your, your system has a cheating method that works for this task and another cheating method that works for this task and another cheating method that works for this task. And you know because these capabilities are not they're latent capabilities. You can't ever directly observe them. You can only infer them based on task performance. I don't think you're ever going to know for sure whether a system has that capability, but that's one way of kind of uh, removing some of these possibilities of, of systems doing well, but not for the reasons we want. I see. So try to co have a broad coverage from different domains that can potentially measure in that kind of capability that you want to certify, and then try to see how much from this range of tasks does the system solve, and from that maybe try to gives uh, confidence about how likely the system actually had that kind of capability rather than cheating for some other spirit correlations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think this is also a place where experimental design is really important. So rather than just looking at how well a system does on, sp on, on a given task, what you can do is you can manipulate the characteristics of that task to try and make sure that you're only changing one thing and uh, so that if, so for example, this object permanence task, you can have the exact same kind of task, except where the object, instead of going out of sight, still remains in sight. Uh, and there, if you had everything except object permanence, if you can move and you, you have good memory, you should be able to solve that task without object permanence. But if you don't have object permanence, you shouldn't solve this, be able to solve this other form of the task. So experimental design is really important and trying to remove as many confounds as possible. Uh, but that's also a big challenge and something that in psychology we've struggled with a lot for many years is how do we design good experimental paradigms to test capabilities. Yeah, I totally agree. Thank you very much. Very yeah. cool experiment. Thank you. Um, in some ways, because these uh, AI systems are relatively uh, deterministic in the sense that we have programmed them. Yeah. Uh, these architectures are known, uh, at least for the public ones. Um, so, in what way does the relation between the architecture, the training data, and then the actual learned parameters influence the evaluation of cognitive abilities? Because on one side, it is completely deterministic. You already know exactly what the capabilities are. It has this many parameters. It can uh, this large of a context window. But at a given point, we kind of lose any perspective or any... Where does the relation to a capability come in from this computational perspective? Yeah, I think this is a super interesting question, and I think it's also very relevant to a lot of the stuff that Tony's talking about in terms of common sense. So I think there's a distinction to be made here between the, the potential ability to do a certain thing and your actual like ability to do that thing. So for example, if we take something like common sense, if you, also even with a human, if you raise a human in a cave and they haven't been exposed to a lot of information about the world, they're not going to be able to pass a lot of these common sense tasks because they don't have the knowledge in order to do so because these tasks require knowledge. Uh, it's not just about reasoning. But we know that humans have the capability to solve these kinds of tasks and if we gave them the right kind of knowledge, then they would be able to have common sense in, in these different kinds of ways. So I think there's a, an interesting distinction to be made there which is very relevant to what you're saying. And uh, But it does make it hard if you're building a test of, of an ability, how do you disentangle those two things? If, if the system is failing the task, is that because it just doesn't have the right kind of knowledge that it needs? If you gave it some different knowledge, maybe it would do better? Or is it because it doesn't have the underlying uh, capability? So I think this is a really complex 
complex puzzle to solve there, and I think it's an important one to, to be making this distinction more clearly than, than we have been. Do you have any ideas on how to proceed with this? Yeah, it's challenging. I think, uh, similar to what, what I was saying to Lexin, uh, to, to have a broad range of tasks where you're, they're not all relying on specific kinds of knowledge. So if you, if you find that regardless of the type of knowledge that's involved in this, in this task, it seems to fail, then maybe that suggests that it doesn't have the underlying capability if we've given it a lot of knowledge. I mean, the thing about these language models is they've been trained on just so much data. So if they can't do these kinds of uh, tasks, then maybe that suggests that the knowledge is not enough. Certainly, they're a lot less efficient at doing it than humans. Um, but maybe it's not the right kind of data in, in the specific case of language models. So yeah, it's complex. But I think there are ways of doing it. Great, great. thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to follow out what Bout was commenting. So in the case that you, you want, really want to disentangle the knowledge and the actual capability that we are uh, inferring, then do you think it's a good approach to, let's say, we find to the system to give them the proper background knowledge for the kind of task that we want them to solve in order to infer this cognitive capability is such an object permanence. And um, do you think that's a good approach or have someone tried that already in the literature? I think, I think that's implicitly what people have been doing with these language models. So, you know, okay, we know these models are bad at reasoning, so let's give them a bunch of data on reasoning tasks and see if that proves their ability to do it. So I think there's kind of this implicit sense of, okay, if, if we give these systems the right kind of knowledge, will they do better? Yeah. Yeah. I, was referring something like that, but a little bit more careful when you give them the data. It's not a, about collecting a bunch of data from this domain and fine-tuning them. It's more yeah. about, like, you have to filter out to ensure that the systems are only obtaining knowledge, but without getting some actual additional capability from those that you want to measure. Yeah. I think it's a very challenging thing to do, but... Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it's a really like, interesting idea. I think the challenge with it is, knowing what knowledge is important for a specific ability and how much knowledge you would need to give it for that ability to work. So there's a lot of these relationships we don't understand very well also in, in humans and, and other animals too. So I think it, it's really hard. And I think kind of my message in all of this is not we can develop the perfect test of any of these things. I think it's more that, okay, there are steps we can take in the right direction with some of these approach that will give us a better understanding of capabilities than we currently have. Yeah. All right, thank you. I think maybe Tony had a question. Hi, Ryan. Thanks. Nice talk. Thanks. I mean, I just want to pick up on something you were just saying a moment ago. Yeah. Oh, two moments ago by now. Um, and which also harked back to a question I was asked about embodiment. Mm. And, and you were talking about giving the system knowledge. Mm. And uh, so there's the kind of, it's almost a kind of philosophical question mm. is to what, you know, can these systems really understand common sense knowledge purely by reading about it? Mm. Or, uh, or it, would it, like humans and animals, actually, you know, I mean, we acquire knowledge in many ways, but typically common sense knowledge by humans is not acquired by reading about it. Yeah. Or even being told about it. Yeah. It's about you know, observing it and you know, doing things discovering what happens when you tip something, turn the bottle upside down or push something over. Yeah. And so I, you know, there's, I mean, people have done a lot of work in the past, or some work in the past about trying to get systems to experiment in the world. And, right. Um, I don't, I, I'm going to slip, is there's a question, is we don't have any <laughs> thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I think there's so many interesting, like unanswered questions, and like you say, it's very philosophical about, when it comes to embodiment, what are the kind of key features of embodiment that allow people or systems to, to gain this understanding or gain these abilities? You know, is it just it allows us to observe information in different ways? Is it something about the fact that you know, embodiment, or at least in, in our world, brings with it certain types of goals that maybe enable the right kind of exploration or the right kind of uh, thinking? So yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting questions there that, that people should continue to, to look into. I mean, it's, it's a... The question is, could, it, could you, do, in principle, yeah. learn all this stuff just by reading about it? Yeah. Or is there stuff which could only be learned by, by doing and observing? Yeah, it's a great question. I don't have an answer. No, 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 no. <laughs> but yes, I agree. I agree. And I, it comes back to what Jose was saying, is you know, how much can be captured in language alone? Uh, and 
Yeah. Uh, and the question is, what, what are the, if, if that is the case, then what are the things that are... Yeah. Of course, it could, may well be easier to do it, and you may yeah. well require m much less training data to do it that way, which is a separate question. Right. Uh, but there's a quasi question of principle as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think the kinds of things, you know, spatial reasoning, like we yeah. can probably start to draw, make predictions about the kinds of concepts that should be harder to learn about through language alone. And then maybe we can start to investigate how easy it is to learn those concepts relative to other concepts that maybe are, are easier to grasp in language. I think that would be an interesting way forward too. I mean, you know, when a human child is learning, I'm not, a cognitive, I'm not an experimental psychologist, <laughs> so let me. But uh, sure. I, I mean, they, they, will, they will try something and then they will observe what happens and then they will do something else or perform another experiment. Yeah. But if you're reading about this stuff, then it's kind of, you, you can't perform that kind of experiment. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And if you see, particularly then see a novel object and you're not sure how it's going to, how yeah. it's going to interact. And yeah, exactly. Maybe it interacts, it kind of behaves in a strange way because of, you know, its center of gravity is not what you'd expect because of the, uh, you know, what it looks like because it's maybe in some special way that means that yeah. it's weighted, you know. Yeah, so from that perspective, I think it's like the embodiment is allowing you to get different kinds of data, maybe sort of more experimental data that, that can dissociate things or, you know, associate things in ways you wouldn't have otherwise seen if you hadn't explored the environment. But maybe there's a way, you know, if we carefully curate the training data we give to these systems, maybe there's a way we can kind of give them that same type of, those same types of data without them actually having to, you know, do the experimentation themselves. So, yeah, I think it's an open question, but it's really interesting. But there's a question, I guess, as well as whether a robot system which is trying to acquire this, this data in this kind of way, and maybe the other, and it's, the, the data is not comprehensive, maybe it could still use it to help suggest what a good experiment might be to conduct in the real world. Hmm, right in order sort of then to refine or uh, extend its knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's all very hand wavy, but. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. More questions? Well, I, I do have a question. Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah, of course, we, we, we have a lot of time. Well, time has passed so quickly. You've been here uh, for a month, and you've been here for just a couple of days, and or both of you are leaving tomorrow. Uh, but we'll have, to, uh, but, you know that um, I'm, I've been a little bit obsessed about when you have these capabilities and you have mentioned, you, you haven't explained because of course this is a good person, that, that some of these capabilities, they have a magnitude. Mm -hmm. It's not just yes or no, so they have levels and things like that. And for some things, this is very useful because it's not that you have memory yes or no, you have, right. you, you, can, you can memorize three, uh, three words and then you can right. use that. Again. My question is going in that direction this kind of trade-off that is traditional in psychology about how much predictive something is about the world and how explanatory, especially for humans. So if we have a characterization of a system in terms of capabilities, maybe we can sacrifice a little bit uh, uh, the predictive power for giving maybe fewer capabilities as a kind of a, a, of a, of a profile of the system that the people can understand, okay, this system has yeah, spatial reasoning. Okay, what do you mean by that? This, this, and this. Okay, I can understand. But you start just A, B, C, D, E, and nobody understands this. You can still predict with these kind of capabilities extracted or, or coming from general principles or something like that. But people are not going to really understand what the, the system is it's capable of. So how do you see these trade-offs, especially in the tradition of psychology or cognitive science? Yeah, I think it's a really, really good question as well. I think the interpretability of these abilities is really important maybe for our understanding of what we should do, like how we should interpret if we know that a system has ability A at level X, how do we then map on from that to the kinds of tasks we want systems to do in the real world? Maybe we can get some of the way by just looking at, like you say, how these different capabilities predict different kinds of things, but ultimately if you have a new task and you're not sure you know, trying to figure out where does this task fit into the picture, then without some sort of conceptual understanding of what these abilities are, uh, and the conceptual understanding of the capabilities of the system, maybe, that, maybe that's difficult. Uh, I don't know, I, I mean, I think in psychology, the thing we've also found is that you can interpret what these capabilities represent in a lot of ways. So maybe it's not necessarily that you have to be able to, but a lot of these abilities do seem to be interpretable in, in ways that we can understand. So Hopefully, we can find a similar kind of thing with AI systems, but, but maybe, maybe not. Maybe the interpretation of these abilities is going to be much more complex because of the way that these systems are structured. I, I don't know. Uh, Oscar, 
Yeah, but he would say conceptual modeling is a solution. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, more questions? Uh, okay, taking into account the number of people that we are and the time, I think that what we can do is just maybe follow the discussion uh, over a coffee, if you like, and, and leave it here. Sorry for the guys that are following, uh, uh, they, are, they cannot join us uh, for the coffee. But it's been a pleasure for, uh, having both of you today. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. <laughs>